Welcome to Good Data's webinar, an introduction to headless BI. I'm Valerie Chen, marketing manager at Good Data. Let's quickly go over some logistics. All attendees are muted upon entry. As you come up with questions, please submit them in the Q&A box within Zoom. We'll address them at the end of the presentation. After the webinar, we will share a follow-up email with the recording. For those who are unfamiliar with Good Data, our global company delivers growth through analytics. Our robust dashboards, custom insights, and unmatched governance options have helped more than 140,000 of the world's top businesses deliver on their analytics goals. We have more than 350 employees and growing, including 200 plus engineers. We're headquartered in San Francisco with additional offices around the world. And we are funded by companies, including Visa, Intel Capital, Anderson Horowitz, and General Catalyst. Today, we're excited to share an introduction to Headless BI and how it relates to GoodData.cn, our newly launched cloud native analytics platform offering. And our Good Data experts here to present this introduction are ZD Shaboda, Good Data's VP of Platform, and Martin Schwablinka, Product Manager for GoodData.cn. ZD, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, so this is ZD. Uh, so together with Martin, we will uh, we will uh, uh, guide you through the concept of the Headless BI. So we will spend uh, just a few minutes to introduce the concept and uh, talk about uh, its importance, why you guys should think about it. Uh, then uh, you will see three Headless BI demos uh, that hopefully uh, give you some better picture, you know, what this, uh, what the Headless BI is about and its values. And then at the end, we will have roughly 10 to 15 minutes for your questions. So let me jump uh, uh, right into the, uh, the concept. So uh, what is the Headless uh, BI? Let me start with, uh, uh, with the trend that we see for a uh, couple of years already. So uh, the number of the analytic consumers is growing very quickly. So the uh, list that uh, 10 years ago, a decade ago, it only included dashboards and, uh, uh, and benchmarks and some self-service tools, uh, some uh, desktop uh, analytics tools and things along these lines is expanding with machine learning, with machine learning notebooks and models and statistical models with many uh, data-driven events, you know, some uh, recommendations uh, that are part of the application, so business workflows with embedded analytics, uh, pretty much every single SaaS uh, application has some uh, analytical uh, section and share some reports and dashboards uh, that uh, that essentially describe, you know, how the, how the business process that it, uh, the SaaS application implements is going and so on. Uh, obviously, there are many other like external portals, external apps, you know, the uh, analytics is shared between uh, hospitality chains, franchises, retail chains, and so on. So many, like, uh, many different internal and external applications that and business processes that uh, consume analytics. And uh, the growth on the data sources, I don't have to talk about, it's clear. So uh, this is something what you, what you know very well. So there are many new data sources, cloud uh, APIs, uh, uh, applications and so on. So uh, companies are forced to react uh, to this situation and uh, uh, they need to modernize uh, their uh, data uh, management uh, architectures. And the first step that they're usually doing is uh, that they consolidate data in some, uh, in some layer and some data warehouse or data lake or some, uh, something similar. So Snowflake is the poster child of this, uh, of this trend. But there are many others, like uh, uh, many of you guys, I'm sure, uh, are using uh, Amazon Redshift, Google BigQuery, or even hosted Postgres or Azure is becoming, uh, uh, is uh, coming up with Azure Synapse and so on. So there are many uh, data lakes technologies like Dreamio, Apache Drill, uh, you name it. So uh, together with uh, this technology, we also see the data transformation technologies, so DBT uh, or uh, Fivetran or Stitch Data to name a few for uh, essentially transforming the data from the sources to the, uh, to the data warehouse layer. The problem is uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, many companies are using the uh, traditional BI tools and traditional uh, machine learning tools on top of uh, this infrastructure. And then a little bit undermines all these efforts, you know. So uh, the problem, you know, with this usage is that uh, 
most of these tools, uh, they define their own strategies. It defines their own calculations and metrics and uh, uh, functions, formulas that uh, perform the data computation. And as there are many of them, and uh, we've seen the situations when uh, there were like dozens of BI tools adopted by a, a single corporations for different departments or different purposes, it's actually very difficult to keep consistency, you know, uh, uh, consistency on the consumption side. So uh, the different tools essentially yield different numbers and uh, uh, these calculations are inconsistent. The problem is that uh, the keeping that consistency of the calculations and formulas on top of different technology stacks is uh, very difficult. Moreover, if you look at uh, how to govern access, you know, to the uh, to those uh, metrics, measures, calculations, or underlying data models, that's even bigger problem. That's even uh, uh, even more difficult to govern uh, access in kind of unified way to all these consumers. So. There is a huge consistency problem that undermines the data, data ops efforts you know, that uh, uh, all the investments that uh, uh, those data ops groups invest into, into snowflakes and into the consolidation on the, on the data side. Uh, there, is a, uh, there are many articles about this. So uh, there was an Airbnb quote that you saw on the previous slide. Uh, Airbnb has been uh, wrestling with this problem for, for quite some time. So Headless BI, is solution to this uh, uh, to this problem. It essentially decouples the consumption of the analytics from uh, the uh, semantic model and from the uh, from the measures or the calculations definition. So it provides a single source of truth for uh, these computations and all the associated metadata. You know uh, that so the data from the uh, data uh, data warehouses or data lakes are enriched with the uh, Business metadata and analytical metadata, and uh, there is and uh, there are there is a layer of uh, shared measures you know, that are published, you know, for these consumers. And those BI tools and machine learning tools and uh, API SDKs or platforms, application platforms, uh, they essentially use open API and SDKs, you know, exposed by this headless uh, uh, BI engine uh, to. To essentially consume those calculations and visualize them, uh, create uh, the data model on top of it, and so on and so on. So hopefully, the headless BI uh, is clear today. In our demos, we will be using uh, our headless BI engine. This is the is uh, the name of the product that is relatively new. We actually launched this uh, a month ago, roughly. It's uh, called Kudata.cn. CN uh, stands for Cloud Native. And that, uh, uh, that's essentially the good data uh, implementation of this headless BI engine. So what you will see is uh, its ability to, uh, to uh, send queries and essentially uh, uh, query the data, uh, uh, send the real-time queries to the, uh, to the data layer. So it supports many different databases. It also, it provides obviously that uh, shared metrics layer. So it exposes the metrics uh, via the open API. And uh, it also includes a couple SDKs for integration and standard protocols for integration of all these consumers uh, that are out there that we talked about. And uh, besides this, uh, this uh, engine is uh, very flexible in terms of deployment. It uh, allows you to deploy it to uh, uh, all these public clouds like Azure, Amazon AWS, Google Cloud, into your on-premises data centers, Kubernetes clusters, private uh, data clouds, you name it. So it essentially can be moved uh, where your data live and it can uh, live uh, along uh, uh, together with your application stacks. It becomes the component of your application stack or uh, together with your uh, data sources. All right, so let's uh, uh, stop talking at uh, this point and uh, Martin will uh, show you uh, the, the concept of decoupling uh, of the of the measures and the semantic model from uh, the uh, analytics consumption. So, Martin. All right, let's jump right uh, right into it. So, uh, what I would like to show you uh, right now, at the moment, is a, uh, a relatively short, but I think pretty self-explanatory demo. Uh, what I'm uh, showing you on the screen right now is uh, basically from the position of the developer on the left side, what I do have is a simulation of my 
web application that can be built on the, based on the JavaScript. It can be ba built uh, based on a React language, for example. It doesn't really matter, but what matter is uh, how I'm going to use it. Well, first, uh, the my application obviously doesn't have the analytical engine included. It's uh, completely decoupled. It runs uh, on its own. And my React application in this case is only the consumer. It's consumer of first, the insights, which means charts and dashboards and so on. And second, it's a consumer of the semantic model, of the, of the data model that is stored in the analytical engine. So what I'm going to show here is just how my application can easily, uh, can easily uh, live and uh, ad hoc uh, be built with the uh, components from the analytical engine. So what I'm showing you right now is uh, that I am just uh, basically adding a secondary measure into the existing chart. So you can see it's, it's easy as this, just, uh, um, just uh, optimize the code, just work with the code and the application itself through the API layer, communicates with the BI engine, gets the data from it, and gets the, uh, gets the visualization such as charts uh, and charts setting and so on. So back to you, ZD. All right, thank you, Martin. So, uh, so let's uh, uh, let's now take a look at that the beast, at the analytical engine. So, uh, besides you know the functionality that we were explaining, so uh, that it exposes the uh, the, uh, the layer of these shared metrics and uh, the semantic model, it uh, uh, it needs to be uh, very open, you know, open to many different uh, environments and many different uh, technologies. So. First and foremost, you know, if you start from the left, you know, from the data side, it needs to support uh, uh, many different uh, data sources. So all these cloud data warehouses that I was talking about, uh, then, but uh, not only them, you know, uh, it needs to also support the NoSQL uh, databases like Mongo's or CouchDB's of the world, steaming architectures like Kafka or Kinesis. So uh, it needs to be able to essentially send queries and integrate you know, with uh, pretty much any uh, data source. Uh, also, it needs to uh, uh, provide access to as many consumers as possible. So uh, it needs to expose uh, those calculations, measures or metrics uh, through the open API that can be easily translated to, uh, to a standard protocols or standard SDKs for uh, pretty much any application, you know, pro, uh, web application, mobile application, on-premise applications, you name it, uh, some uh, machine learning uh, notebooks or uh, machine learning models, pretty much anything what needs to consume the, uh, the, uh, the analytics today. Also, you know, this, this, as I said, you know, as a, in a data box mode, this becomes uh, uh, the component of your existing application stack. It will become a very important component of, uh, uh, of your uh, data ops infrastructure and so on. So it needs to be very well integrated with continuous integration and continuous delivery. So this is uh, the stack that uh, the data ops teams are adopting these days. So it needs to, uh, needs to have the ability to declaratively define everything. So uh, data ops teams can easily uh, install it in the, uh, uh, move it from the development environment, you know, to the, uh, to the QA environment and then to the production. And uh, it, needs to, it needs to be versioned, integrated with the versioning software and so on. And uh, last but not least, uh, the integration with user management is very important as well, uh, because uh, uh, I was talking already about these uh, governance rules. So uh, you need to be able uh, to define access to pretty much any user of the application uh, to uh, those shared metrics and uh, semantic model elements. All right, so uh, next demo. So Martin will show you uh, the way how, how this uh, engine works with the uh, uh, BI tool. And also, it will show the declarative nature of the of this analytics engine. Okay, so let's jump uh, right into it. So actually, uh, what I would like to start with first <clears throat> is the semantic model. Well, first of all, what is semantic model? Semantic model is the layer. Uh, that uh, stands on the top of the raw data, whether it is the database or data warehouse, uh, such as uh, 
such as uh, Snowflake. And it uh, defines the, the uh, um, uh, up, basically abstract on the raw data. And it presents the uh, data and metrics and measures calculations, you name it, that you or any consumer of the uh, analytical engine is going to need. So <clears throat> uh, what, I will, uh, what I would like to show you now is that I will switch the context into be the data analyst. So I will jump into what's native for the data analyst. And that is, this is, this is uh, dashboards, charts, insights, and visualizations. You can see that I have prepared a very simple uh, dashboard that is built on the top of uh, the uh, selling uh, data of a retail company that sells uh, a simple uh, four type of gods. And I have prepared a simple uh, dashboard to demonstrate how the data analyst work. But um, <clears throat> what happens when I would like to, for example, add a new uh, chart, add a new visualization, is that I will go into the design section of the BI tool. In this case, I'm using, of course, the good data.cn. And what you can see is that I have on the left side, I have an access to the very same semantic model that I was showing in the previous step. This is the same data, this is the same metrics. So what I would like to do now is that I want to build one new chart in uh, my dashboard because this is what data analysts do, right? They, they are specialists into the visualization part. So I could easily uh, use the graphical user interface to add new calculation. In this case, I will be calculating the amount of, uh, uh, of the orders uh, within my uh, retail company, but this is not the point. What I would like to demonstrate it is the declarative way how to do it and why. Well, this is because many companies nowadays, they do have what we call data ops engineers or data ops teams. And these guys are specialists into their own data. They understand the data. They understand what calculations need to be uh, made in order to prepare data the correct way and provide the consistent results for every consumer of the semantic model, whether it is, um, for example, the web application that I was showing in the previous demo, or whether it is a data analyst working in the BI tool and preparing dashboards. So let me jump into the tool that is called Postman. Uh, Postman is one of the most <clears throat> one of the most uh, uh, used tools for uh, utilizing the APIs and leveraging the APIs communicating communicating with the HTTP endpoints. And what I would like to do here is that I want to um, set up and, and uh, create one new metric that I will send to my uh, analytical uh, analytical engine. In this case, it's a simple uh, simple metric as I was uh, as I was um, describing before. It's just an account of the orders. And what I'm showing here now is the declarative way, aka JSON format, which comes with the predefined syntax. And uh, this is uh, this is basically the definition of a metric that I can store in a JSON format anywhere. As a, as a uh, data ops engineer, I can store it in, for example, GitLab or GitHub, wherever uh, the, the versioning repository uh, you guys are using in your uh, companies and within your teams. So what I will do now is that through that API, I will send and create the metric into the analytical engine. So I go 201. So I'll go back here into, uh, into my uh, BI tool here. And now again, I'm, I'm back uh, a data analyst. So what I will do here is that I will refresh my look at the uh, semantic model. And you can see that the metric, I, the, the uh, data ops created for me is immediately available. It's a very same metric calculated the same way that I can now take and I can use it for my visualizations. So for the demonstration purposes, I will create one that is uh, pretty simple and I will create a heat map chart that uh, will give me the numbers of sales for the individual uh, type of selling that I have within my retail company. And one more thing that I would like to show you to kind of uh, underline the declarativeness, the, uh, of course, the metrics, the calculations are not the only thing that I can set up and that I can uh, manage uh, and deploy the declarative way. What I would like to show you here is that that the analytical model that I was creating in a previous step as a data analyst is something that I can access through the API as well. So what I have just did is that I've sent a request to my analytical engine and the request was, 
give me the analytical model definition. And you can see that everything that I was creating there, all the dashboards, all the insights, I have here in the declarative way as well. I can version it, I can store it and manage it in my repositories. So that is it from my side for now and back to you, Zidi. Uh, thank you, Martin. So uh, uh, next step, we essentially uh, jump right uh, to the last demo we have, and that actually uh, shows how uh, developer is supported uh, uh, by this headless analytical engine and uh, how the developer can create uh, applications by composing them uh, from uh, uh, from uh, uh, composable widgets. You know, so how uh, how the developer can embed individual uh, individual uh, data visualizations, how uh, how the developer can embed the dashboards, and also perhaps the whole uh, you know uh, visualization self service visual, uh, self service dashboard creation and uh, data visualization creation tools. Okay, so back to me here. And the last part that I would like to show you here is will, will take me actually back into the uh, into my React application because what I would like to show you and I partially teased it in the first demo and Zidi was talking about it right now is uh, how me as a developer now how I can access that metrics layer <clears throat> that semantic model that I was showing you before. So what I will do here, I have switched into the different page. At the moment, I have here one chart that display here the revenue and orders. But what I would like to do is that I, in my application, <clears throat> as a developer, I don't care what query stands behind the metric. All I need to do is just get the metric from the uh, data ops engineers and use it in my application. So what I will show you here is what do I need to do when I want to create new chart in my app, for example. But uh, what I'll do is that I will not use the, uh, the same metric that uh, the previous chart is using. But I, what I will do is that I will list here the metrics and data that I have available from my semantic model. And what you can see here is that I'm getting the very same, uh, very same values and very same uh, data that you saw as a data analyst that you saw uh, in the semantic model layer. So don't don't mind the uh, don't mind the uh, the errors here. It's uh, rendering ad hoc. But what I will do here is that I will use the number of orders, which is exactly the metric that I have created in the step before. And if everything goes right, I should get um, <clears throat> the new chart that gives me right away by the direct query into the database. No data are preloaded, no data are pre-cached or something like this, but just simple uh, simple command like this, I can add the new chart and utilize the metric that has been created before. By the way, for this uh, type of embedding into, uh, into the React application that I'm using, I'm using uh, good data SDK, which is good data.ui SDK, which gives me all the methods and lists all the data and metrics for me. This is it from my side. Back to you, ZD. All right. So uh, thank you for uh, for your attention. So let me just quickly recap. You know what you uh, what you've seen uh, today. So you've seen that uh, new concept of the headless BI engine that uh, that is declarative, uh, that uh, uh, that features the open API, and then that, that shares. Martin, can you please uh, jump to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, and that uh, uh, that exposes uh, uh, the uh, the semantic model and the measures, you know, to all different analytical consumers. You saw how how this uh, layer, how this headless BI engine can be accessed, you know, from multiple different environments. Uh, later, we can show you uh, the integration with uh, with uh, things like, for example, machine learning models, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, we also shown various different capabilities of this, the declarativeness, you know, the uh, ability to uh, support the data ops. So uh, everything, you know, what is created visually or what is create, uh, can be also created with the declarative definitions over APIs that allows you to automate the testing, automate the deployment process, you know, from uh, development to QA to production and significantly shorten the data ops uh, cycles. So, I think that uh, it's uh, uh, immediately apparent why this uh, 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 this uh, uh, architecture can't be built, you know, with uh, the standard uh, BI tools. Most of them have their roots in the desktop uh, 
uh, in the desktop uh, BI, and they were somewhat ported to the cloud. Uh, so, but uh, they essentially lack, you know, many uh, many capabilities uh, of uh, that you would need, you know, for this uh, uh, for building this layer. They uh, copy the data uh, frequently into some in memory, in -memory locations. Uh, that uh, uh, essentially prevents real time, that uh, uh, doesn't provide enough uh, performance. Uh, also, they are very, they have very monolithic architecture with no open APIs, open layers. So they failed supporting uh, uh, those uh, analytical consumers at scale. Uh, and uh, they have the biggest problem that we, that we were showing is that they tightly couple the analytical model and the data. And that uh, this essentially causes the uh, the inconsistency problem that we talked about. So everything what we uh, what we were showing today was built on this Qdata.cn, the headless uh, BI engine. Uh, you've seen uh, the uh, key capabilities. So you see the declarativeness, you know, every single component, you know, of uh, of the of this BI engine can be uh, defined declaratively over API. You see how it supports. Uh, the different con analytical consumers uh, through the open API, how this exposes the, uh, the metrics and semantic model. Uh, you saw the, uh, the way how it's integrated with the composable, uh, composable UI widgets. So uh, essentially a good part of uh, how uh, we would use this engine for, uh, for your data, uh, data house efforts. And I really think that uh, a couple of years from now, when you look back, you know, this, uh, you will ask yourself question why you ever thought that this uh, kind of last mile isn't part of the data ops. We believe that this is something what, uh, what really needs to be part of the data ops stack, you know, the uh, this Atlas BI engine for, in order to, uh, to kind of, uh, uh, so the analytics consumers can use the all benefits and consistency of the, of the data ops stack. All right, so uh, if you are more interested in this Qdata.cn uh, engine, you know, it's uh, very easy to, uh, to install it and evaluate it and, and start developing the uh, developing solution on top of it. Uh, it's as close as uh, like one uh, terminal, uh, terminal uh, command line, uh, command line statement away. So this is the single command line that you, need to, that you or your developers need to issue to, uh, to install everything to their uh, to uh, their uh, uh, computers and start uh, working with uh, uh, with uh, this new uh, cloud native engine. Also, there is a very strong community. So uh, we've already built a, a community that uh, you can access through our website. You know, there are, uh, our people are sitting on the community and helping, you know, and answering the technical questions. Martin, please, uh, can you advance to the next slide so we can see the URLs? So, uh, uh, so there is a uh, there is a strong community on our website in the learn section. There is uh, something what we call university. There are quite a few courses that uh, that get you started and uh, make you uh, proficient, you know, with this technology uh, very quickly. All right. So that's all what we wanted to cover today. And uh, now we have roughly fifteen minutes for your uh, for your questions. All right. Thank you, CD and Martin. So like CD said, now we have some time for a Q&A. Um, let's take a look at the Zoom Q&A box to see what has come in. All right, so first question, does the front end interface support some form versioning as well? Yes, absolutely. I think that if you look at the, uh, if you if you saw the code, you know the uh, the interface is essentially a code. So uh, uh, we support this on the code level. So the everything, uh, uh, every kind of aspects of the widgets, uh, the settings, the connection mapping to the underlying the uh, uh, semantic model, plus any uh, characteristics like colors, like type of chart or whatever, you know whatever you need to configure that might be either uh, defined inside the code dynamically or uh, you, uh, this uh, widget can actually reference uh, the declarative configuration something what has been created uh, uh, has been created previously on the uh, in the headless engine and uh, it can uh, take all these configurations from this declarative configuration so in this case in the other in the in the other in the later case uh, the uh, and I think what it's uh, what uh, your users would change with uh, their BI tools you know, will immediately propagate to uh, to the application. So 
uh, your users can easily customize uh, those uh, uh, those widgets. Thank you. Another question from the same attendee. Is it possible for two or more data analysts to collaborate on the front end interface and build pieces of the dashboard simultaneously? Yes, this is actually enabled uh, through the declarativeness of the uh, of uh, of the dashboard. So, as you saw, you know, declarative uh, uh, declarative uh, definitions are human readable, so they can be versioned, they can be merged. So, this supports uh, this uh, uh, this kind of uh, parallel development from multiple by multiple developers. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, why would we need to use the semantic model when we already have SQL? Oh, that's, that's actually a topic that uh, uh, I think we should do the whole webinar on this, you know, but let me just, let me, let me just uh, quickly explain this. You know, there are numerous reasons. Uh, one of them is that uh, uh, if you saw, you know, what you saw from Martin, you know, people are used to work with numbers, you know, so uh, the queries are some kind of foreign concept to them. So. Uh, not all uh, people can essentially write SQL queries. Not all users can write SQL queries. Not all users understand the underlying data model. And uh, so that's one uh, set of reasons. You know, another set of reasons is that uh, if you look at the standard dashboard, that dashboard might have roughly, I don't know, 15, 20 visualizations or something along these lines. And uh, some of these visualizations need one SQL query to uh, to pull the data from database. Some of them need more. So my estimate would be that you would need roughly like thirty to forty queries uh, to uh, to uh, populate a dashboard. If you look at this uh, semantic model and metric approach, you essentially need like three to five metrics, and those metrics are composable. So you can derive new metrics, you know, from the existing metrics. So uh, in case you need to change anything, if your underlying model changes, you know, you do just one change, you know, in semantic model that gets immediately propagated to all these other layers versus like uh, changing, uh, you know, 15, 20 queries, you know, per each dashboard. And then if you do the math, look at some larger solutions, there might be easily hundreds of dashboards, uh, then the refactoring uh, is uh, very difficult. But as I said, there are many, many other reasons, you know, uh, most, uh, many of them are, uh, Usability reasons, uh, refactoring reasons, uh, and uh, <coughs> manage manageability reasons, and so on. As I said, I think that we should do uh, a separate webinar for this. All right, noted. We will have a separate webinar on that, Vivi. I'll take you up on Good. that. <laughs> Another question Can we localize the UI and metadata? Yes, uh, uh, the localization is available in eight, uh, uh, I believe, eight languages. Uh, there are still some depths, you know, that we are implementing on this new product. So uh, we will have the localization soon. Uh, but uh, if you look at our standard engine, we already have it localized. So I believe like eight languages. I don't want uh, don't want to be mistaken. Uh, everything is in our documentation. Another question: Is the declarative API covering the whole functionality set of the analytical engine? I will take this one. Uh, no problem. Um, uh, yes, this that's uh, that's true. Basically, uh, everything that you have seen uh, in the in the uh, in the demos, uh, all the metadata, all the objects within GoodData.cn are available to be defined a declarative way to through the APIs and even more. Uh, also, not only uh, basically defining the uh, the objects and the metadata, but also the the actions and tasks that you do with the good data .cn, you can also leverage through the API. So, for example, uh, adding a new data source, uh, connect uh, connect uh, the parts of the engine with the data source, and so on. So the answer is yes. Thank you, Martin. What is the pricing structure of good data .cn? Okay, so essentially there are like two, uh, two, uh, two types of products that we have in, in this product line. The, uh, the first one, the first set uh, are uh, the products that developers use for development. You know, so this is the, uh, this is the engine that I was talking about, the Good Data Community Edition. It actually provides everything what uh, developers need for uh, 
for developing a new solution. Everything what you saw here and uh, the, all the kind of uh, semantic models, measures, APIs, everything, uh, all the connectors to the underlying databases. So this is the development uh, development tool, testing tool, something what the data ops engineer is using for developing, uh, uh, developing uh, uh, the application or uh, uh, the metrics and so on. And uh, uh, so that's the first uh, set. The second set are production uh, production uh, products. So products that uh, components that uh, you install into the Kubernetes cluster, whether that Kubernetes cluster is running on top of Azure or uh, or uh, Google Cloud or AWS, it doesn't matter, or whether you have your own Kubernetes cluster uh, that it's installed locally. So uh, those are obviously uh, for the ops people. So once uh, you have some solution and wants to deploy it to production, you would uh, uh, you would uh, use one of these uh, additions. And there are three additions of the uh, of uh, this production, these uh, three production additions. Uh, the first one is free, uh, free forever. So uh, this uh, supports the open source uh, databases uh, plus uh, Vertica. And uh, uh, and then there are uh, there is uh, there are two more layers uh, growth and enterprise that essentially provides uh, more uh, uh, more capabilities more functionality uh, to uh, this Atlas BI engine. Thank you. So quite a few questions here. Here's another one. Uh, can you elaborate how the Headless BI supports the data ops team? Okay, I think uh, we covered that uh, quite a. Well, so the, to me, like data ops is uh, is uh, the same effort, you know, that we've been running here at Good Data for decades, you know, uh, for more than one decade, like uh, DevOps. So essentially, to me, this is mostly about uh, uh, the quality and consistency of the results. So uh, data ops to me is about uh, uh, about the separate uh, in the first place, you know, about separate uh, development, uh, Q and A, and production environment. So, if you look at declarativeness, this is the key concept. Uh, that this declarativeness and ability to essentially capture everything in a versionable uh, JSON or YAML uh, YAML file is a key concept to this data ops. So, once you have this, you know, you can easily uh, kind of extract something, automate uh, the uh, kind of movement of the solution from uh, between those three environments, and automate the testing and essentially uh, uh, roll out to any any uh, 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 any uh, environment automatically so i think that the declarativeness is the is the key concept you know that supports this uh, this data ops that's why we are actually focusing on the full 100% coverage of apis and the full declarative uh, declarativeness uh, declarativeness capture, captures the covers the, uh, the every single definition of this headless bi engine what from your components is open sourced? Are there any plans for the future? So yes, we are considering open source. There are quite a few of them open source. So the uh, Good Data UI framework, for example, that Martin was showing is open source completely. Uh, and uh, we are actually considering uh, open sourcing the Good Data.cn. So this is uh, some kind of pending decision on our side. And there are many others, all the SDKs are open source and uh, uh, there are uh, drivers are open sourced as well. So uh, uh, quite a few components. I think the most significant one is the good data.ui. Okay, someone else said, great webinar. Is the MySQL supported? MySQL, uh, we had a plan to support it, but we ran into some difficulties. Unfortunately, we do not support it at this point. Uh, so uh, the reason is, uh, uh, that uh, uh, there are specific reasons, like for example, implementation of the full outer join, you know, that uh, uh, that MySQL uh, lacks, and uh, also some performance reasons. We are looking at this, you know. Uh, I have to admit that it was in our initial plans, but we had to uh, we had to remove it from the uh, from the initial release. So, based on the demand, and I've seen like two requests or three requests so far, we will be uh, we will uh, uh, we, con uh, we will reconsider this. Although I have to say that uh, MySQL, if we compare it from the performance perspective uh, with Postgres or other alternatives, uh, it's not uh, the most performant database for analytical queries. You know, that's my experience, based on my experience. All right, I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, have you designed the solution to work primarily in a specific environment, such as in Azure? 
Uh, not really. Actually, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, the cloud native technologies like Docker and uh, uh, like Kubernetes, we mm, this is pretty kind of normalized layer that uh, uh, runs on top of the on top of all uh, all public uh, clouds and and private clouds and so on. So uh, yes, you know we have some. There are some specifics. You know when when these things need to uh, where we need to install to Azure, for example, or GCP. Our documentation uh, capture uh, you know, describes these uh, uh, these differences. So, uh, uh, so not really. You know, there is not like one specific target environment. We were targeting initially targeting uh, uh, all public clouds and uh, the Kubernetes and Kubernetes uh, local uh, Kubernetes clusters. Can the self service analytics tools be embedded to a UI application similarly to the individual widget? Yes, absolutely. So we didn't stress that out, uh, but uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the analytical designer, so this is tool for creating the visualization and uh, uh, the, uh, the dashboard tool uh, that allows dashboard editing uh, can be uh, also uh, uh, embedded into uh, the application. So users, you know, end users uh, uh, can get access to, uh, to these tools and they can create their own dashboards have their own visualizations and customize uh, their applications and, and analytical solutions. Okay, great. Which industries have you seen the most use from so far? Uh, I'm perhaps not a good, uh, 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 not sure Martin, whether you have more uh, information here, but uh, we are actually, we are, uh, we are, if you look at our customers, you know there are obviously some, you know, uh, some industries uh, like hospitality, for example, finance, uh, there where we have uh, like the large customers and many customers. But I think that there's, I do not see any, any uh, exception. I think that this is adopted across the industries. E-commerce is uh, is uh, uh, is uh, particularly successful in the last few months because of race of e-commerce companies, uh, finance, uh, uh, but. Uh, I do not see any kind of large exceptions. I think this is uh, adopted throughout the uh, throughout uh, uh, the industries. Um, another question just came in. How can we talk with your experts without talking to sales guys? Do you organize some online meetups? Yes, we do. So uh, we have something called uh, office hours. You know, that's uh, uh, twice every week. You know, this is part of our community. So. Uh, so you can join the office hours and we have our best technical people on these office hours. You can ask any question and uh, uh, we actually plan to do more meetups. Uh, uh, so uh, that are kind of less formal than, uh, than webinars and we would like to really uh, uh, go deep you know, into, the, into the technology and have uh, like more direct conversation with you guys. Also, one more uh, one more thing that you can do is uh, that you can join our Slack community, right? Where there are the special channels uh, for GoodData.cn and for any technical uh, technical parts of our products that you can that you can join and you can ask the question in there if it's uh, if it's uh, about about our product. It's pretty open and I definitely recommend to to use it. We also did a, and pardon my ignorance here. We also did a live demo. So I'm not sure you know, that was right after the launch. You know, I'm not sure whether we have any uh, anything scheduled. You know, uh, uh, anytime soon. Uh, Martin, do you have more information on this? Yes, we do. I think there is uh, still uh, a few more demo available. I think you can uh, access them and register for the live demos, which is uh, roughly from 20 to 30 minutes live demo with uh, definite options to ask questions. Uh, and you can register to those demos through our Good Data University. All right, great. Another good question. What's easier to start with, your free version that's on your website or this Docker image? It really depends on uh, your preference. So, uh, uh, the, if you want to really, if you don't want to bother with the installation, although like Docker image installation is super simple, uh, then uh, I would probably go with the uh, with the hosted version where everything is pre-installed and you can just uh, have everything up and running in like a few seconds right after the registration. Uh, also, uh, the onboarding experiences is uh, is a little bit further in this hosted version. 
Uh, however, if you are a developer and if you want to really uh, test uh, the APIs and uh, and uh, take a look at the uh, deeper on this uh, headless BI engine, I would uh, rather recommend uh, uh, the uh, 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 the good data .cn, the community edition. But it's really up to you, you know, up to uh, up to your preferences. All right, so we're about one minute out, a little bit less probably. So I'm going to wrap up. Um, if we didn't get to your question, please feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to, to answer those. I know ZD and Martin are eager to talk to all of you more about gooddata.cn and Headless BI. So thank you to our audience again for asking such great questions. Many thanks to ZD and Martin. To learn more about gooddata.cn and to try out the community edition, please visit use.gd slash cloud hyphen native. And Martin, if you want to go to the next slide, you'll be able to see that URL. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your attention and uh, many questions. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Have a good day. Bye.